I don't think I was in the corridor. So welcome back everyone and hands straight over to Ricky. Hey, uh, welcome to the session. I'm going to be talking about building IDPs with uh, Flexible. Uh, so just an introduction. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, Ricardo Guerrero Cruz. You can just call me Ricky. It's way shorter. I'm a principal software engineer at Red Hat. I am a member of the productization team of Ansible. Basically, we are, you know, responsible for um, creating the products of the of the whole ecosystem of Ansible. And um, I'm previously uh, I was previously very involved in OpenStack. When I joined uh, Ansible, I uh, was uh, at engineering a couple of years, then OpenShift engineering, and see on this the office doing some tech stuff with OpenShift. So I need to talk. Briefly about DevOps, uh, I know that you know you must have your own definition, your organization must have its own definition, but I need to lay some ground for the next slide, so I need to talk about this. So DevOps is a set of processes and tools to accelerate the delivery of software. Um, what it means? So you've probably seen that infinity symbol everywhere. Whatever you know, you go to a DevOps conference, you Google for something about DevOps, and it contains a bunch of words between that infinity symbol. Uh, those words basically define the um, phases for building software. If you follow the DevOps principles, which are planning app uh, application, coding it, then you build it, then you test it, then you pass on to the apps team, which they release it, they deploy to prod, then they operate and monitor, and depending on you know missing features or bugs, then you know it's a feedback loop back again into planning, coding, building, testing, and it never ends. Um, um, it aims, DevOps aims to remove silos between developments and their operations teams. Now the problem is that it can come with the cost of huge cognitive loads uh, on teams because you know how it works. So uh, with DevOps we are uh, supposed to know about CICD, infrastructure provisioning, config management, monitoring, and you know in all those areas you have to, you know, VMs, containers, uh, metal servers, uh, serverless, uh, Prometheus, uh, you know, you name it. It's huge, right? So uh, it's uh, unbearable. At times, you know, I just want to become a farmer and be away from civilization, right? Um, so how we can actually fix that or try to at least out of you? So that's, um, you know, the intention of platform engineering. Uh, yet another, you know, definition. That's uh, the definition of how I understand it. So platform engineering is the discipline of designing, building, and maintaining of service tools and automated workflows to accelerate the delivery of software. Now you may be saying, oh, wait a minute, isn't this like pretty much the same thing as DevOps? It really is. The only thing, this is basically just a DevOps approach or a DevOps ev evolution, if you will. The key thing here is what I put in bold. It's self-service. We need to have, you know, an automated way to do all those things. So what uh, platform engineering, you know, proposes is that they're going to be like a platform engineering team that makes DevOps practices and tools uh, an internal product. So if it helps you, you know, in your mind, it helps, it helps me to picture uh, what this is. It's basically DevOps as a service. So uh, it's basically create uh, applications and APIs to do the things that we do today for DevOps. So what are uh, internal development platforms or IDPs? So the IDP is actually the internal product that the platform engineering team design, build, and maintain. So that's the deliverable of the platform engineering team. And this platform contains self-service APIs and optionally a portal. Uh, you know, you can just access with a browser, so you can just click button and do things. That typically cover things like infrastructure uh, management, config management, CICD, authentication, authorization, observability. Uh, you know, the usual things that, you know, we can all, all you know, identify in, in a typical uh, DevOps, uh, you know, methodology. So how can we use Ansible to build IDPs? I'm not going to do, you know, a, a very deep introduction. It's the second day of the conference. You know, uh, other speakers and colleagues, you know, you probably know what Ansible is. You've been told about, you know, uh, better introduction that I can I give. But again, Ansible is a very easy to learn and use for automating any IT task. It's, it's just a tool that, you know, it's, it's great for that. 
you can find lots of content available in Galaxy ready to install and use to do all sorts of things, you know, for managing, you know, clouds, AWS, Azure, GCP, you can install Jenkins, uh, repository management, CACD for any kind of system, Prometheus, any uh, observability, you name it, right? Configuring service. There are uh, lots of content out there. Uh, even if there's a ton of content, maybe, you know, there's something that, you know, you cannot find or you don't like, and, uh, you know, it's relatively easy to develop, uh, you know, new content by just using roles and YAML, or maybe, you know, uh, some plugin in, in a collection. And even you can use a simple content builder for scaffolding a lot of, of that work, as my colleagues uh, Sumit and Angela showed in, in the talks uh, from, uh, from yesterday. Then you, we can also also leverage AWX, uh, you know, for doing uh, for building IDPs. It basically provides a central console for using Ansible. It's just you know a web application with APIs, which you can just uh, log in and you can have access to all your automations, uh, you know, in a central you know location. And on top of it, you can also have like self service portals that can be used on top of AWX because maybe you don't want to. Um, exposed to your organization to the AWX abstractions uh, that they are very Ansible specific, like inventories and you know execution environments. You want to have just a service portal that your organization can just go and I want to have a cluster or I want to have a, a Redis or I want to have a Postgres SQL and just I want to request a service with a click of a button and they get it. They don't want to need to know about you know the all the intricacies about you know uh, what is a job template or whatever. So now I'm going to show uh, a demo. Uh, I recorded it because I'm not worthy of demagogues ever, you know, as proof. <laughs> what I'm going to do in, the, in this demo is I'm going to install AWX, and uh, as an example, I'm going to create a service that is just going to be very simple, create a, an AWS VM. Then we're going to create a developer user that, you know, will be able to use that service, and then we're going to use a self-service portal on top of AWX to abstract away the um, a, um, Ansible intricacies and also because it provides a workflow approval mechanism in which we can give a chance for the admins of the platform engineering to review the service request, the type of service request that it is, the inputs, and have a dialogue with the service requester um, you know, to give us feedback. And depending on that, we may or we may not grant that service request. Okay. okay, so this is uh, the view of an OpenShift cluster. I use OpenShift because I want a Red Hat, so it's easy for me. You can also use Kubernetes. So if I go to the Operator Hub and I type, you know, AWX, you know, uh, and I just click on install. Uh, we're going to need to create an empty space to actually, you know, uh, put uh, the AWX operator. So we create an empty space um, named AWX. We click on accept. So what's going to happen right now is that OLM, which is Operator Lifecycle Management, it's an operator that runs in the cluster to install other operators. So it's going to pull AWX operator and install it into our cluster. So now it's installed. We can go and check on the conditions, whether you know it's effectively has been installed unit correctly. It says that you know it's all good. So now what we're going to, to need, we will need to create a custom resource for AWX. It's actually our instance of our AWX. This is where we put all the configuration for how we want to run and install you know, our AWX. So we uh, add a name to the custom resource. Uh, I'm just going to use all the defaults. The only thing I'm going to ch change, I'm going to set the ingress type to, sorry, the service type to node port, because it's an internal cluster, I'm not on the cloud. Then I click on create. So now what's going to happen is that the AWS operator has a bunch of controllers that um, take care of various custom resources. So, the AWS controller is going to pick up that custom resource 
uh, with all the pills that you know, the options that we put, and it's going to basically create a bunch of different Kubernetes objects, deployments, uh, services, config maps, secrets, that make up the AWX you know, installation in a Kubernetes environment. So as you can see, we can also check the conditions of the AWX custom resource. So if we click on it, we can also go to the resources tab, and the AWX custom resource is going to itself have underlying resources for the installation of AWX. Services, again, the deployment secrets, everything that make up uh, an installation of AWX in, in a Kubernetes cluster. Now, if we wanted to check the installation, we can actually go to the AWX Operation Controller Manager um, to the pods. And if we go to the AWX Manager container, we can actually see what's going, uh, what's going on regarding the installation. And if you see, I know it's, it's, uh, you know, uh, it's very little you know, fun, but you can recognize it's actually an Ansible play. This is actually one of the coolest things, is that the AWS operator uses Ansible, which is all Ansible. So AWS operator has been written with something that is called Operator SDK, which is a framework that Red Hat builds and maintains for building operators. And one of the cool things is that you can actually build either Golang-based operators, or you can also use Ansible or even help charts. So if you have expertise, for example, for installing a particular web application and you want to move to Kubernetes, you can just use this framework so you can basically reuse your roles to actually install that thing into Kubernetes. I'm going to take advantage that, um, you know, it's a recording because it's going to take like nine minutes to install AWX, so I'm going to fast forward to RDB. I think it's around minute nine. Yes, so if we see here, yeah, so the play ended, said Ansible Runner, you know, executed successfully. So now, you know, we have AWX up and running. And we can go uh, to the uh, AWX uh, custom resource and we can check, you know, the, its conditions to make sure that, you know, everything is good. So we we'll scroll down. Uh, again, we can see that, you know, Everything is successful, the conditions. So right now we have uh, this uh, up and running. We can, once again, check the resources that we created uh, you know, as part of the installation. So now we need to expose the UI for AWS so we can access it. So we need to create an ingress. Uh, in OpenShift, there's something that's called OpenShift route, which is very similar to ingress in, in AppStream. So here I'm creating a route. I'm just selecting the AWS service. Uh, I'm tying to the AWS service. I create the route, and that, that gives me back a URL that I can just click. That opens up a top. So now I have access to AWS in my cluster. So now I need to log in. So if I go to log in, I need to have like the admin password. So if I, both, uh, I go to the secrets, uh, and I look for the AWX admin password, I can just go and copy the value. I type admin, I paste the password, and I'm in. So right now, I'm, we, are using, we are seeing the admin view of AWX. You know, that's for, uh, with, you know, everything. Projects, inventories. Plates, credentials, you know, everything that the admin view has access to, basically. So what we're going to do now, we're going to create a developer user to do the demo. So I create a developer user with a developer password. Uh, I can see organizations it belongs to, which teams, which roles it has, right? So in order to you know, demo this thing, the yeah. two views, I'm going to open a new browser, Firefox, so uh, we can actually log in as a developer, okay? So I have now the Firefox you know, correspond to the developer user, Chromium to the admin user. So we copy paste the URL into the Firefox browser,
we type developer user developer password Ah, there you have it, the developer view for, from a, uh, for AWS. As you can see, you know, it has less things because it's a normal user, it's not an admin user, so it has access to less things, right? So you can actually check, you know, the organizations it belongs to, the teams, the roles, you know, everything that, you know, is tied to the developer user. So now for this demo, as I said, we're going to use uh, um, a repository containing a playbook for creating an AWS VM, okay? Um, so a project is basically um, something that you link to a GitHub repository or a GitLab repository containing playbooks, and AWX is going to sync that content down locally to AWX, so then it can later you know, run it with the execution environments. So here I'm creating a new project for the demo, and I'm uh, specifying that it's going to be a Git, and I put the URL for the config management camp demo. Uh, I'm gonna have all the links at the end of the slide, so just in case you know it's too small to see. So we save it. It will take a few seconds to sync from the Git remote down to the AWX. Okay. Now successful. We can see you know the access that that project has. So right now it's just admin. We may we may optionally give access to the developer user to have access to that project, so they can use you know the playbooks associated to that project. Um, you know that this is what I'm showing here. This is one of the, the cool things that AWS has is that it has rollback access control. So you can basically give you know whatever access you want to teams or users to each one of the various um, objects that it has. Another thing that I wanted to note, uh, this is just a demo. Typically what you want to do is you want to grant permissions to teams and assign users to teams because otherwise you need to give your know, permissions developer by developer, which is not a great thing. So now you know the developer you know has access to the project because we just granted access to it. So this is the playbook that you know we're going to run as part of the demo. It's a very basic playbook. Just create an EC2 instance by passing parameters for name, region, keeper, instance type. You know, just you know when it comes uh, back up, we try to SSH, and once you know it's all good, then we're going to display uh, a message as part of the playbook. Hey, you can just type this SSH, I guess this host name, and you can log into it. Very basic example. For this playbook, we're going to need to have a, an inventory that contains localhost. Uh, luckily, AWX already bundles the demo inventory, which contains localhost host, and it sets the Ansible connection to local, so we can just use it. We don't have to create a new one. Optionally, we may also want to grant access to that inventory, so the developer user can use that inventory uh, in the job templates that it creates. Just optional. So we go to the developer view and we, if we refresh the inventories, now it has access because we just granted access to it. And you know, we can effectively check that you know, the host of this inventory contains local host and it's using Ansible connection local. So now the developer can uh, create its own job templates using that inventory. So by the same token, we're going to need to create credentials to, in order to create an EC2 instance and to SSH to our machines. So in this demo, I pre-created the keeper on a, the AWS account that I'm going to use, which is using a keeper that I pre-created as well. So what we need to do is uh, basically add those credentials to the AWS. 
So right now, I'm going to create a machine credential that contains the private key. Save it. And now we do the same thing uh, with the access key. This is one of the reasons why I wanted to also do the recording, uh, because I didn't want to be, you know, thrown around, you know, creating a key, an access key live. So even so, you know, I would triple check after this. <laughs> but I think I removed my IM user associated to that key. Anyway. So I have the CSV that I downloaded from the AWS console for this access and secret key. So those are the values that I put in the fill. Access <clears throat> key and secret key. So right now, as soon as we save, we now have two credentials. So one for creating EC2 instances in AWS and an SSH key that you know, is associated with the keeper that we have already on the AWS. So we can actually uh, SSH to the VMs that we create with the uh, template yeah. in a little bit. And again, you know, we may or we may not uh, add permissions. Uh, it's a role-based access control, so it's either admin or read or use. Uh, it's a very powerful system. Now the developer has access to it because we granted access. So now what we're going to do, we're going to create a doc template that is going to use that create VM playbook that is within the product. So we create a create AWS VM doc template, which is going to use a demo inventory, since it uses localhost, with our project, uh, the default execution environment. Yeah. We're going to also add the credentials for um, uh, AWS and the ADSSH key. And we're going to hard code a few things as part of the job template. We're going to hard code the image ID. Uh, it's going to be always, you know, uh, uh, an Amazon Linux, in this example. Uh, we're going to hard code the keeper, because as I said, you know, we are um, something that we pre-created and we just want, you know, be tempted to just use the same. Uh, since the AMIs are, you know, things that are tied to region, I'm also hard coding the region. So I add the template. And I go to the service section because I want to ask the, the job um, uh, run uh, to provide, you know, some uh, parameters. In this case, you know, the instance name, how you want to call it, and the instance type. But in this case, we're going to provide a default. So by default, if you don't put anything, it's going to be T to micro. Okay, so we enable the survey and we give access to our developer user. Again, this is not best practice. You typically want to grant access to teams and associate users to teams rather than straight to users, just for demo purposes. So now if we go to the developer view, Since we granted access to the job template to the developer user, he can he can see it. And if he launches it, the survey pops up, and you know he can put you know the name of the VM and the instance type if the if he wants to or she wants to because there's a default, right? Oh, so here we're calling it Hello Config Management Camp. We launch it, and you know we are gonna see an Ansible play. Uh, you know. Uh, in the web page, the standard out. So that the playbook is right now creating the EC2 instance with the credentials that we're using for the job template. And if we go to the AWS console, we can see that there's a, a corresponding VM created, uh, you know, to that job run. So as soon as the EC2 instance comes back, in running state, it would just move on, make sure that you know it can connect to SSH, and then you know it will print 
uh, okay, you can just copy paste this command uh, to connect to the instance. So there you go. So that's the one liner that we can just copy paste. So if we, if we go to a terminal, we can just copy paste uh, where we have uh, our um, key that corresponds to the credential that we uploaded to AWS. So there you go, you, we run this SSH, we pass the key, and we can SSH just fine to the VM we created with AWX. Now, I'm going to pause a little moment. I mean, if you think of it, this is a bare bones self-service portal right now. I mean, you can do whatever you know as well as you do. You can create job templates, and you can just, you know, expose them to your developers so they don't have to do all the level of thing of, you know, infrastructure management, <coughs> management, all those things. Now, the thing is that, you know, the AWS, you know, is very specific, you know, to Ansible. So you may not necessarily want to have all your, uh, you know, engineers and other teams to have to know about that. And more importantly, you may want to have like a workflow approval mechanism in which you know, they can just do a service request and you would review the service request before the job template is run. And that is something that we can solve with a service portal. In this demo, I'm going to use SESQuest. I'm going to put the links after it. So again, this is my official cluster. Uh, if I go to my terminal where I have my Kubernetes manifest for deploying SQuest, so first of all I need to create a namespace for holding SQuest, so I'm, I call it just SQuest. And then I apply the manifest against that namespace. That's going to create a bunch of different, you know, Kubernetes objects. You know, PVCs, config maps, secrets, deployments, everything that, you know, makes the SQuest application. So we can check on the command line to see, you know, how the solution is going by checking the, the pods. You know, it's doing its thing. Some are running, some are container creating. Uh, we can also check the deployments to see whether, you know, all of them, they're ready. So we get the deployments. Yep, comes back up that everything, you know, uh, they're all ready, and all the pods are running. So now again, we need to do the same thing. We need to expose the, the UI of SQuest by creating an ingress. In this case, I'm going to use an OpenShift run, because uh, that's the mechanism that you know, we have in OpenShift, but you could also use ingress. We create a route name SQuest, and I select the service of the Nginx um, uh, service of SQuest, with its port. I create it, and then that brings me back a URL that I can just click to access the UI of SQL. So if I click on it, a new tab pops up with SQL. So this is, again, self-service portal that you know just leverages <coughs> AWS for doing automation. So if we're logging as an admin, this is a, the view of SQL. It's, a, it's just a service catalog, so it doesn't have you know, notions, or, or at least you know, it doesn't expose things like inventories, execution environments. What we need to do first, we need to link SQuest to our AWS. And for that, we need to specify the host of our AWS, okay? We need to uncheck, uh, at least in this demo, that uh, we're not using HTTPS because we're just exposing plain HTTP. And we're gonna need to have a token to link them up. So if I go to AWX and I create a, an application for SQuest, say that, so now we can see, you know, it has no tokens, so what we need to do, we create a token and we associate to that application. Click on admin. Tokens, you add the token, and you select the SQS application we just created, 
and we give write the scope just for this demo we copy the token and we go back to the S quest and we put it into the token field and now we save it so this stage S quest and AWS are linked and uh, right now if you click on it it's going to show the job templates that are available in AWS so effectively we have the create AWS VM job template with its survey whatever right now what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to create a portfolio that is going to uh, contain our services to, so they can we can have our users to request services so we're going to create an AWS portfolio which is nothing but a container of services not a Docker container just a container as a generic thing we can put a you know a shiny logo and we're going to create a service for virtual machines things so we call it virtual machines we can also put an icon if we want and we bind it to the AWS portfolio and now we this is how we link our job template from AWS to the service so we basically say okay so this service is going to be created a VM which is going to use created AWS VM job template this is the mapping so you add it and now it's available so if we go back to the service catalog we get the AWS portfolio which is going to show up the virtual machine service which we click it's going to show up you know just the survey from the job template since it's using just you know AWS job template for creating the AWS VM but you know everything you know is hidden you know that complexity if you will or that abstraction um, so it's just you know a service catalog it's not about job templates it's user environments or anything so now what we're doing we're going to create you know a developer user again what you may want mate you know typically you may want to do this without that right but you would create teams associate users to teams and grant permissions to the teams but in uh, this is just a demo so I'm just creating a, a developer user so again just to differentiate I'm going to open the developer view on the Firefox browser so Firefox browser we open a new tab if we go to the SQS URL we can now try to log in as developer <coughs> So this is the developer view of S Swiss. You know, it's uh, uh, you know uh, more simple because it doesn't have admin rights, but it does have access to the service catalog of AWS, the portfolio, sorry, and the uh, the services associated with it. So, as an example, let's say that I'm a developer and I want to request a virtual machine. So I I click on the service, I put the name. And I can optionally put a comment something like, hello admin, can you please create this VM for me? Okay. However, in this example, we're going to put config and GMT cam demo as quest as name, but it's going to override this attack from T2 micro to M1 small. For whatever reason. It also has a view for uh, seeing, you know, the dial in the chat, uh, you know, for the service request. So if we go back to the admin view, the admin is going to see that request coming in. So he can click, um, you know, to the, uh, you know, to the tab and, you know, the, uh, the type of request. And he um, notices that, you know, it's a M1 small instead of T2 micro. So... It replies back, sure, you know, I can write your request, but better if you use T2 micro. Because I'm sure that with those savings, maybe, just maybe, you know, we're going to hit, uh, you know, our targets, and maybe we can get the bonus just this time. So he sent it back. Uh, the developer is going to see that dialogue that comment and you know the developer, oh you know having a bonus is a good thing uh, you know I don't mind I don't mind having T2 micro you know so a bit 
So it's going to reply back. So the admin is going to see that, you know, the service, um, uh, the, the developer, you know, requesting this is okay with it. So it's going to review the request now, and that gets a chance for the admin to override the request. So it's going to override M1 small to T2 micro. And it's going to move that request to accepted state. So that obviously, you know, is also seen by the developer, so it's now happy because it's going to be, uh, you know, soon be processed. So when the admin, you know, has a chance to process it, it can just go <coughs> click on process the service request. And uh, as you can imagine, what's going to happen, this is going to do S-Quest talking to um, AWS running the job template that eventually is going to create a VM on AWS. That's why you have a tower job ID associated to the service request. If you click on it, it's going to open a new tab for the underlying job run, and it's the same thing as Earth. And if we go to the AWS uh, console, we can see that effectively a new instance you know, has been created with T2 micro instead of M1 small. So the verbal user can see that it's processing and hopefully you know, after, after some time the playbook, the job run will end and then you know it, it will have you know access to its feed. Now so that is the end of the demo and the end of the talk. Uh, I, I guess the key takeaway that I wanted just to provide with this talking demo is that you you don't have to switch stacks and be using you know the latest you know hype thing right now just because you know a new term has been coined you know by the industry like if you just use a lot you know ansible or you know whatever you know tool you get, you use just use it and you know be awesome and then you know uh, have fun along with it and that's pretty much it uh, if you want to just uh, connect with me, I no longer use Twitter. I, uh, I found it funny that you know, I'm not the only one that is no longer using Twitter. I just use LinkedIn. But I'll be around here. I'm also be talking the next talk with my colleague Walter. And I will be tomorrow at the contributor um, track of Ansible. And that's it. All right. We have time for some questions. If anyone has any? So how is the uh, commission model um, mapped to S-Quest? S-Quest has a different... Ricky, Ricky, put Oops. it back on Oops. and repeat the question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Bad uh, it doesn't share the same... Repeat the question. Yeah, so he was asking, I mean, how it maps the permission from AWS to S-Quest. To my knowledge, S-Quest has its own. So basically, you, what you may want to do, the way I would do it, I would just use Zelda. And, you know, that way, you know, you have the same thing, you know, everywhere. And, you know, maybe you have, you know, some um, teams that they're not comfortable with S-Quest and you just want to grant them access to uh, AWS UI. That way, you know, you have, you know, the same um, of them not to see. And that's it. Okay. Thanks again, Ricky.